from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you, guys. How awesome is this to be 15th Annual National Book Festival? Welcome. Uh, and thankfully, we're indoors. Uh, this is our second year indoors. We could be all outside right now. So uh, thank you. I'm, it's great to be literally here. Um, so my name is Michael Kavna. I write the Comic Riffs blog for the Washington Post daily. Uh, I was a syndicated cartoonist for years and an arts editor. And uh, I just, you know, I love graphic novels. And to me, uh, somehow they, they reach out to kids and they, they, you see brains come alive. Uh, and today we have an amazing writer who understands kids profoundly because, uh, you know, what she does, and pardon these glasses, it is so bright up here, it's, uh, wow. Um, you know, last night I was on a metro car. We had a gala, and uh, it's about midnight, uh, so what, muggy, 90 degrees humidity. Uh, we're stuck in a tunnel, no air conditioning, cattle car, shoulder to shoulder, 105 degrees. Finally get up, we're sweating, people are dropping. Thankfully there's no smoke, but uh, I get home and I'm feeling sorry for myself. And then I pull out El Defo and read about a four-year-old four girl wearing a, going to school wearing a huge phonic ear and trying to deal with this. And I felt like a heel immediately, but it re-inspired me because here you have in Cece somebody who writes about as a little kid, I don't know how many of you guys, look at all you, have teachers who you, you're kind of curious what they do when they leave the room. Well, she writes about the teacher she had to plug in to, 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 for deafness this sonic ear, this phonic ear. The teacher would go to the restroom and, and the kids would play and goof off until the teacher could come back, right? And how did they know that the teacher was coming back? Because on this phonic ear, Cece here could hear the teacher in the restroom. <laughs> she could hear him wash up and she'd go, teacher's coming, teacher's coming. And she was instantly a superhero to all the kids because they knew when they could play and knew when they had to straighten up. Anyway, hers is an amazing story. It, uh, she spent about 40 years processing it, what it was like. Uh, and this book, El Defo, uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, it's won the Eisner Award this year. It's been critically lauded. It's her first graphic novel. And she told me last year, she said, I don't know how anyone writes more than one of these in a lifetime. <laughs> she spent five years on it. It's just a powerful book. And there's one thing, I hate to, di to disagree with fellow members of the media, but uh, the New York Times wrote of this book, it is highly inspirational to anyone who is different. And I'm sorry, but this book is highly inspirational to anyone at all. It's amazing. Please welcome our in-house superhero, CC Bell. Is this working? Yeah. Awesome, okay. Hello, hello. It is wonderful to see you and um, to be here in Washington, D.C. for the National Book Festival. And thank you all very much for coming out to this particular um, presentation. So I will indeed be talking about my book, El Defo. And El Defo, if you haven't read it, is of course a graphic novel, a book in comic book form and it, it is also an autobiographical graphic novel because it is a story that I wrote about myself. And El Defo is absolutely the nickname that I gave myself when I was a kid because I am deaf. And so I want to talk a little bit about what it was like then and even now being deaf. And so I'll start my talk with exactly how I became deaf, which is in the book, and then we'll do a little experiment together to find out just exactly how deaf I am. A little experiment. And then we'll talk about hearing aid technology and superpowers and superheroes. So to start things off, and this is how the book begins, um, in 1975, a long time ago, when I was four years old, I got very, very, very sick. And in the book, I drew one panel, just one panel of me throwing up. There's nothing better than getting to draw throw up <laughs> in a book. 
but I only drew one panel of me throwing up. What I should have done was draw many, many, many panels and many, many, many pages of nothing but vomit <laughs> because I threw up everywhere and it was so much vomit that my parents became very, very worried and they took me to the hospital and I was diagnosed with meningitis, which is an infection of the brain. So I did get better, but there was a side effect and the side effect was I lost about 85 to 90% of my hearing. So what my parents decided to do, and if you think about it, since I was four, I already had a good foundation or an experience with language, with spoken language. So I knew how to talk and I knew what words maybe were supposed to sound like. So I think my parents were thinking a hearing aid, in my case, would be the right thing to do. So just think about that for a little bit. But first we'll do our little experiment because sometimes people assume that if you're deaf, that maybe you can't speak very well. But there's a whole spectrum of deafness. And, and I try to make that very clear in my book is that this book is only about me and my experiences being deaf. There are many, many ways to be deaf. So in my case, um, I use hearing aid today and back then to hear. So our little experiment is, part one of the experiment is I am going to leave my hearing aids in. They are behind the ear hearing aids. And I'm going to turn my back on you, count to three, and then when I get to three, I want all of you to shout hello as loud as you possibly can. And you know, maybe blow the roof off of this room, blow the roof off the whole National Book Festival, and I will let you know if I could hear it. And then part two is I will take my hearing aids out and I will turn my back and count to three and you will shout hello again, just as loud as you did the first time and I'll tell you whether or not I could hear it. And then, hopefully you'll believe me, then you'll know just how much I can or can't hear. So, first part. And the reason I'm turning my back on you is because if I was looking at you, I could see all of you shouting, and that's a giveaway. So I need to not be looking at you. So, here we go. So this time I'll turn around, hearing aids in. Here we go. One, two, three. Oh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gracious, okay. I think everyone in this whole room is weeping um, from that. I definitely heard that, definitely. So now, part two of the experiment, I am taking them out. And when I take them out, I want you to get a sense of just how small they are. Okay, so here's one. Okay, you can barely see it. And hopefully I won't step on them. <laughs> Here is the other one, okay? And now that they are both out of my ears, I cannot hear a single thing that I am saying. I know that I'm talking because you are all looking at me as if I know what I'm doing and I can feel my throat vibrating so I know I'm saying something. So I'll turn around, I'll count to three, you guys will shout hello and then we'll see what happens. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Have you shouted yet? <laughs> you did? Okay, well, I did not hear that at all. Okay, so this will hopefully show you that hearing aids do work. And they don't work perfectly. There are lots of problems with them, but they really, really help. So I really don't hear very well at all. So let's go back to my story. We're still in 1975, and so my parents get me my first hearing aid, and it's just a little box, and it's very different from these behind-the-ear hearing aids. It was a little box with cords, and the cords went up to my ears. And so for kindergarten, 
they were able to find a school that had a program in which all the kids were just like me. We all wore little boxes. We all had little cords. And it was, um, it was like any other kindergarten except we were also learning the skill of lip reading. And so this is the point where I talk a little bit about sign language. In 1975, the thinking was very different than it is today. And the thinking was, well, we want all deaf children to be able to speak and to read lips. So we won't teach them sign language, at least in this program, we won't teach them sign language because that will be a crutch that will get in the way. Looking back on that, I personally think that was a bad idea because I don't know what the sign language interpreter is saying. I've never learned sign language, but it would be so helpful to me if I was down there in the audience talk, listening to someone else, if I knew what the interpreter was saying, that would help me so much. There are many situations where I wish that were the case, and I want to learn it very much, and I just can't seem to find the time. But one of these days I will. But back then it was lip reading, lip reading, lip reading, lip reading, and that is looking very closely at whoever is talking to me so that I can see the way their mouths are moving, and from that I'm able to understand them most of the time. But if the person were to turn their back on me, what I would hear would be more like, bum, 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 bum. even today, as a kid, it's just garbled gibberish. I have to have the mouth to understand what the person is saying. But the sound that I'm getting from a hearing aid really helps. It, I need the visual stuff and I need a little bit of the sound. And I also have to read all the clues around me. Like, if the person looks really angry, <laughs> well, I think they're talking about mad things. If they look really, you know, ah, I just went to the Kroger and it was wonderful, you know. Then, you know, they're happy thoughts, they, you know. And so you have to read the people's emotions and what they're holding and what they're doing. So there's a lot of brain power being used when you lip read. So anyway, I learned how to lip read. I was pretty good at it. But then for first grade, we moved away from the school that had the program where all the kids were just like me. And I ended up being the only kid and a new kid, new kid at school, and the only kid at school who was deaf and the only kid at school who had to wear this ridiculously big hearing aid. And I still have it. And I brought it today. I'm going to put it on so you can see what it looks like. And then we're going to talk a little bit about awesome hearing aid technology and how it can transform someone into being a superhero. So it's in this little box. And the product is called the Phonic Ear. It still fits because I did not grow very much. <laughs> okay. So anyway, every day before school, and I only wore this hearing aid to school. At home, I had a different hearing aid. But every day before school, I would strap this on, and the earpieces would go up to my ears like this, both of them at the same time. Okay. So I would strap this on every day. And right now, for my demonstration, it is on top of my clothes, but in real life, in real life, I kept it totally hidden and covered because I did not want anyone to see this. And so I'm the new kid in school, and I show up at school with this thing on, but it's covered, and so my, my stomach is sort of jutting out a little bit. And the other kids, and I remember this well, the other kids came up to me and said, there's something not right with you. What's going on behind your clothes? What is that? And instead of just saying, I'm deaf, I don't hear very well, my answer was, I am pregnant. 
I am going to have a baby. I do not know how it got there. <laughs> do not ask me those questions, but I am pregnant. So that gives you an idea. It was more embarrassing for me to just tell the truth, which there's nothing embarrassing or wrong about being deaf. I just did not want to be that different. I would rather be a pregnant six-year-old <laughs> than a deaf one. So very, very odd, very strange. But even though I was embarrassed about it, I kept wearing it. And the reason is, is because this thing was part of what's called an FM system. And this thing works together with this, the teacher's microphone. So remember, this is the 1975-1976 model. The flesh color is really unattractive. There are many unattractive things about this setup, but I kept wearing it because my t-shirts would wear this. So every day I put this on, and then when I got to school in the morning, I would walk to the t-shirt's desk, and she would put this on around her neck. So what this did was it amplified and clarified my t-shirt's voice just for me. What that means is if she were standing right where the sign language interpreter is standing, and she said, hello. I would hear her say hello as if she were speaking directly into my ears. Then let's say that the sign language interpreter, or in this case my teacher, was standing in the corner of the classroom and she said hello. I would hear her say hello again as if she were talking right directly in my ears. It didn't matter where she was in the classroom I could hear her as if she were talking right in my ears. Soon, maybe about a week after I got this set up, I discovered that when my teacher was leaving the classroom to maybe fuss at a classmate, I would hear her then too. <laughs> Aha, and very soon after that, I discovered that I could hear my teacher wherever she was in the entire school building. Okay, just think about that. And even better, I could hear her. She could not hear me. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. <laughs> so, what was I hearing? I was hearing all kinds of stuff. I could hear her walking up and down the hallways because she wore high heels and I would hear click, 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 click. Or maybe she was in the smoking lounge because back then the teachers could smoke and I would hear this. Oh, those students are terrible. <laughs> I can't take it anymore. Okay, I might hear something like that. Or um, maybe she was just going to the Xerox machine and I would hear, whoomp, 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 all kinds of stuff. It picked up everything. And then, of course, the one very personal, private thing that every human being has to do, sometimes several times a day, I know you're wondering about it. Hmm, what about when my teacher used the bathroom? And the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> I heard my teachers when they used the bathroom. So the big question is, well, how did I know? How could I possibly have known that they were in the bathroom? Because when people go to the bathroom, they don't just walk along and go, gee, my bladder's feeling kind of full. And look. There's a door. It's got ladies on it. I believe I'll open this door and go in and relieve myself. No one says that. They don't speak. They don't give a commentary. They just go, okay? And so I had to be a sound detective. And what that means is I listened. And I would maybe hear, I would listen maybe and hear a creak. I thought, okay, that sounds like the stall door. That's got to be the stall door opening. But maybe it's not. Maybe I'll get lucky this time. But then I would hear zip, uh-oh. And then maybe a rustling of clothing. Rustle, rustle, rustle. I thought, oh, no. And then I would hear a sound as if my T-shirt were standing at a river. <laughs> this flowing water sound. What could it be? But there's no river in front of G.W. Carver Elementary School. 
oh, no, no, it's that. And then I would hear the ultimate giveaway. Ah. <laughs> the sigh of relief, followed by, of course, Ooh. So that is when I knew, number one, that my teacher was using the bathroom, but number two, that I, oh, number two, uh-oh, I didn't even think about that. Um, that, uh, sorry, bad. Um, that I had caught my teacher in the most vulnerable moment, and in that moment, I realized that I had superpowers, okay? I could hear my teacher anywhere. I could hear her when she was the most vulnerable. I was just like Batman, okay? Batman is really Bruce Wayne, just this rich dude who uses his money and buys technology, straps it on his belt, and bam, he's Batman. Well, I was the same way. I have technology, right? And I strap it on my chest, and I go from being meek, mild, boring C.C. Bell to El Defo, okay? Super, super power, superhero, hearing everything. And so... The real question is, and you will have to read the book to find this out, did I use my new powers for good or did I use my new powers for evil? <laughs> and actually the answer to that, just a little giveaway, is I used it for both. I did good things and I did bad things, very good and very bad. So that is what the book is about. It also covers friendships and trying to find perfect friends and it also talks about having crushes on people that um, the boy who lived just a couple doors down from me was a beautiful boy and you know crushes are fun so it's about all kinds of things but the real thing that I hope kids take away from the book is that it is better it is far better to share the things about you that make you different than it is to keep them hidden away somewhere. And it took me years and years and years to figure that out. But everybody feels different. You're going to be more, you'll have a lot more fun if you just share the things that make you different and not hide them. Because those are your superpowers. Those differences are what make you really cool and really unique. And so share those things and don't keep them hidden. So. That's my presentation. We have about five minutes for questions. And what I'm going to do is I sometimes have a little trouble lip reading people at a distance, and especially with the bright lights. So I'm going to ask Michael Kavner to come back up. And if you have questions, go ahead and ask. And if I need help, I'll ask Michael to help me um, sort of be the translator a little bit. So. Can I just say, wasn't that inspiring? Seriously awesome. Seriously. Yeah. All right, so questions. Okay. So we have, okay. we have so two we'll microphones. Okay, so we'll start here, so and then we'll go back and forth. Kids okay. and big kids, come on up to the two microphones. Right? Yeah, okay, okay. So this one starts. Could you hear anyone when they were anywhere in the school? Could you hear anyone? If I tell me, could you hear anyone anywhere in the school? It was your teachers, right? Because you were miked to the oh. teacher for classrooms, okay. right? I could only hear. I could hear the teacher, and I could. It would often pick up the person she was talking to. For example, if if I was the teacher and this was Principal Kavna, I would pick up both voices. But the person had to be wearing it to be able to pick it up. If that makes sense. Would you want that superpower? Uh-huh. And then oh, I'll go nice. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then I'll go over here. Okay. How did you get the idea to make a book out of it? Was it how did you get the art an artist to make a book out of it? Ideas. The ideas. You spent 40 years on this idea, right? The, the, on the idea. How did you get the idea to do this? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait, say that question again. Yeah. How did you get the idea to do this? So how did Oh, oh, the idea. Well, I have been living it for 40 years. And, um, but the actual, it actually came about because I got really frustrated with myself one day um, because I was in a situation where everything would have been a lot simpler if I had just said, hey, lady, I'm deaf. Speak clearly. And 
instead, I let this woman really hurt my feelings about this big miscommunication. And so in that moment, I thought, you know what? It is time. It is time to just tell the world I am deaf and there's nothing wrong with it. And so that's how it all got started. It got started in that moment. Yeah. <laughs> and may I, may I just add, she has many other books like uh, she illustrated Cranky, Cranky Doodle, right? Yeah. And uh, what's the rabbit book? You oh, have, uh, <laughs> this, the, yeah, and the sleepover. Yeah, so she's been illustrating for a long time, but now she wanted it ready to tell her story. Right, right. Um, how did you get into drawing and writing? How did you How did you get into drawing and writing? How do I handle the drawing and the writing? How did you get into it? Oh, how did I get into it? Thank you. <laughs> um, I actually always wanted to be an illustrator, and I worked as a freelance illustrator for years, and I wanted to be a children's book illustrator but um, nobody would hire me. And so I read somewhere that I would have better luck if I both wrote and drew the pictures. So I wrote my first book, Stock Monkey Goes to Hollywood, way back in 2003, and that was how I got started. And so I've done a lot of picture books, but um, I really wanted to be an illustrator, and the writing came later. Yeah. Over here. Okay. What inspired you to write? Similar question. What inspired you to write? Oh boy. What inspires me to write? Um, let's see. Well, I got a lot of nutty ideas that um, that just kind of, usually when I'm out on a walk, I like funny things. And anytime I get what I think is a funny idea, I just write it down on a strip of paper and I stick it in a drawer. And when I feel like I'm ready to do a new book, I just open up that drawer and find ideas and smush them together. So um, I mostly, what inspires me to write is making other people laugh. That's my whole goal, is making people laugh. Yes, sir. How did you um, draw? Did you draw it like on paper and then, or yeah. did you? Like yeah. in a computer. Exactly. What art materials did you use? Are you drawing digitally, the board, watercolor, ink? What are you doing? Yeah, what's your process? Every book that I've done is different, but for El Defo, I actually purchased a big, um, oh, it's like a big pressure sensitive tablet that hooks up to my computer. So I was drawing it by hand, but directly on this tablet and using Photoshop. To, to draw all the lines and everything. And that made it easier for the person who colored it to get the files and color them. But I do a lot of um, painting with acrylics and um, it kind of depends on the book. But I knew that this one was gonna be so much work that I decided that the computer would help make it go a little faster. Yeah, a little bit of everything. Right here. Um, in El Defo, it kind of um, there are kind of a lot of hints that you really liked Batman. Is that true? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are. We know this. There are a lot of hints that you really like Batman. Like, that's your superhero. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, yeah, Batman. Batman. I love Batman. Um, not so much in comic book form, but it was the TV show. The one that was on when I was a kid in the 70s with the ba 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 you know, the great song, and the kapow, and the bam, and the colors were so beautiful. And because I was watching a lot of TV, before TV was captioned, it was such a beautiful visual show for me that made sense because it was active and, and just beautiful to look at. So it was very inspirational to me. Any, any show that had, um, um, like a physical comedy, like the Carol Burnett show, or um, Three's Company of all things, Jack Tripper tripping over the sofa, that's awesome. So um, I was just really into TV, and that was how I got into Batman. Could you hear um, when your teacher um, put up a problem? Could you hear without So it's, could you hear when your teacher put up a problem, right? Yeah, you mean the actual like chalkboard and yeah. What, what could your teacher hear? And we're gonna wrap it up this, one more question we can do after this? Okay. okay. 
could I hear when the teacher was putting up a problem? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and that, in fact, was the whole reason. This is what I should have been using this for. I should not have been using it to listen to my teacher using the bathroom and other things. It was for educational purposes, and it worked really well for that. And um, so, yeah, and it, it worked. It worked really well. In fact, I would say that I was hearing better than any of the kids in class. I never missed anything because she was always there talking in my ear, if that makes sense. Yeah, so we have one more. One more. One more question. Okay. Was it scary writing your autobiography? Yeah. Was it scary writing your autobiography? You told me you're putting your, stu you're, it's, you have to be courageous. You're putting your life out there on the page. Yeah. It was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. And the main reason was um, I had, I live very much in the hearing world and I didn't have as much experience in the capital D deaf community. And I was very, very worried that the story would offend the community in some way because um, I was only, that's why in the afterword of the book, I was very clear to say, this is just my story and you know, all forms, any way that you want to deal with your deafness is a-okay because it's your personal thing. But I was just worried that I may have crossed some lines and um, hopefully I haven't and the truth is the interactions that I've had with both hearing and deaf people have been nothing but positive. I've made new friends who are deaf and that has been the most amazing experience to come out of this personally for me. It's been a great, great ride. Say, everyone should go. Please, you should get El Defo. I, I, it's it truly inspiring. So I'm going to turn around, and in three seconds, how big a hand can we give to Miss CC Bell here? Thank you so much. Bravo. Of course. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.